Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kreis and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Friederike Lübke. Friederike is a professor at the University of Helsinki. For her PhD dissertation, she conducted extensive fieldwork on Yalunka, an endangered variety of Yalunka spoken in Guinea. She is currently working on rural multilingualism in southern Senegal, combining linguistic descriptive, anthropological linguistics, uh, and social linguistic perspectives to explore the social meanings attached to different registers in this highly multilingual region. She's also interested in small scale and organic multilingualism worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Friederike as she gives her talk on convivial linguistics, initial thoughts on the documentation and description of language ecologies. Yeah, thank you. And hello, everybody. I see, uh, if not many uh, familiar faces and at least familiar names on black tiles, which is really lovely. And uh, I should probably start by explaining how I ended up giving a talk in the Rift valley network i mean the clue is you know in the rift valley which is the opposite end of africa from where i usually work and it all began on twitter um andrew harvey posted a review of um Eckhart wolf's uh, handbook of african linguistics in which i had written a chapter on uh language endangerment and language documentation and called uh for an extension of language-based outlooks to include uh, linguistic ecologies and also to investigate the relation between languages as reifications and multilingual variable speech more. And Andrew said in his review, <laughs> a quote, uh, to my best memory, um, that this, my chapter was the most provocative um, in the volume. <laughs> and um, but that I also, um, which I, I, I took to be positive, uh, I hope I wasn't entirely wrong, but he also said um, that I don't do justice um, to previous language documentation efforts, to which I replied on Twitter, you know, okay, I, I wear <laughs> that badge with pride of being provocative, but I didn't mean uh, to devalue previous approaches. And in fact, I, I find them indispensable and would pr pretty much like to extend them and build upon them. And, but there isn't, there's only so much room for nuance in a handbook chapter to which he replied, well, there's only so much room for nuance in a tweet, but would you like to give a talk for us in the Rift Valley Network on this topic? And then I thought, yeah, this would be actually really nice. Um, um, to talk to fellow field workers on these issues, which are pretty much ongoing thought processes and, and work in, in progress. And so the original idea was that I would talk about, um, you know, the documentation and description of language ecologies. And then I started thinking about this and writing an abstract and uh, all of a sudden, um, my, my thinking went around this idea of conviviality and that it is really all about conviviality. And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about and uh, let me dive straight in. So conviviality and um, conviviality is of course related to the epistemological status of language um, and uh, if we, you know, only view extreme uh, ends of, of views of language, then we have approaches that see language as a structural system, um, you know, langue, eye language, etc. cetera, uh, you know, a grammatical system. And then uh, we have a view that sees that is social meaning and is expressed through speaking, writing and signing and other semiotic means. And um, there is also um, a belief that, you know, linguistics is, um, or descriptive linguistics is the description of languages which have been uh, previously identified through their formal, some formal, formal properties. And of course, there are many different ways of identifying languages, even if we look at formal properties, intelligibility, etc. 
Um, but on the other side, there is a tendency to discard the notion of language altogether, most recently, actually, in a, um, an article by Anna Dolmert in Digit uh, magazine. OK, so what do we do with these two camps? Well, my position, you know, they are very often actually uh, pretty much separated, don't talk to each other, or only actually characterize each other in very simplistic terms. Like here, you know, on the left hand, you have the essentialists, you know, the, uh, you know, called out for committing epistemic violence, etc. And on the other hand, you know, you have the, you know, these postmodern approaches, etc. Uh, who want to get rid of the baby with the bath water. So there's a wall, we know walls are not good things. Um, as an East German, uh, I know that <laughs> very well. So uh, my invitation would be, okay, let's, you know, look at both sides of the fence and let's sit on it actually, um, because it's actually quite nice to sit on the fence um, because, you know, you broaden your perspectives. So, and that means, and here we're getting really to conviviality or to some solitudes. Um, and I'm borrowing here an image um, from the applied linguist Jim um, um, Cummins, um, who has been speaking, and I'll get to that a bit later, about the this conception of uh, solitude of language. And so th three solitudes that I think um, you know, it would be nice to partly <laughs> overcome is one is this loneliness of the field worker and also of the consultant in, in research. And the solitude approach to language, multilingualism and speech communities, and also the solitude of academic discourses and disciplinary perspectives. And uh, so I suggest conviviality here in this talk as a conceptual tool to uh, see and explore how we can do this, but I suggested to complement and enrich solitary lone wolf research, not to supplant it. You know, I also know that, you know, solitude uh, is, is an important part and parcel of our work, and I do not wish uh, at all to, to devalue any lone wolf activities. And uh, I have no reason to do so because, you know, I am, my, large parts of my field research has been conducted in this solitude, lone wolf fieldwork uh, framework. So this year you see some photos from my PhD research in the Futa Dialong of Guinea. And you, you know, this, this photo is this really prototypical of a solitude based uh, approach to language. I, I still remember how it was when I conducted my fieldwork and uh, I would allow myself three times per day for social interaction every morning. I would uh, go through the village and greet everybody and uh, try to get hold of my consultants. And then we would work in solitude. You see here, one of my consultants is really exhausted, um, you know, on verb paradigms and text. And I would fill, you know, flex records and, and ledgers with verb paradigms and uh, derivations and grammaticality judgments. And then I would go out at noon and then in the evening. Uh, but my, what I really considered my field work then was really this solitude, you know, um, looking at language as structure. And, um, and then what was the social outcome of this work um, is, you know, also <laughs> really typical uh, because my work was not meant to have social relevance. You know, my work was meant to uh, have a linguistic impact. And um, so it was in this giving back to the community paradigm, you know, so there is an add on an afterthought that we should do something for the community. Actually, what people wanted me to do there was uh, teach English, which I didn't want to do. Um, I wanted to create a primer, <laughs> you know, and create an orthography for Dialonke, which I learned uh, actually while I was still creating it, it was quietly superfluous given the social linguistic situation where people had been writing uh, for centuries uh, in, in, in Fula Ajami. Um, 
Another output was a health center for which I um, procured funding through the German embassy. Uh, this was desired uh, by the community, but it was in no way related to my linguistic fieldwork. So there was no connection actually um, between what I, was, what I was doing as a linguist and, and a benefit to the community. And also, of course, when I had finished my PhD, um, I changed target in institutions and countries, and I was not able um, to maintain long-term relationships um, with the people of Sadiq India. So then, since then, actually, um, I have been <laughs> forced, so to speak, uh, to try out more convivial ways of doing fieldwork. And there's one really important aspect I want to mention here that really pushed me towards this conviviality and that I think um, it's becoming more and more important, not just um, from epistemic perspectives, um, um, but also through our rethinking of our practices in, in the pandemic, for instance. And this is so, you know, I was not able to carry out this research in solitude, you know, that gives you quick results regarding an ap approaching language as a system because I went to the field with a young child. Yeah, here you see my son, Max. And, um, you know, many of you who are parents and carers have, uh, whether you're field workers or not, uh, have probably experienced in the past year <laughs> how impossible it is to work in this concentrated way when you have a child. And so this was ha what happened to me uh, from 2008 onwards when I started going to do field work in Senegal this time uh, with my son, who was 18 months when I went for the first time. And so initially I really failed, you know, I, I felt I was a failure. I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't produce this, the output that was required. What I did, however, was spend hours and hours here, you know, sitting, you know, um, and uh, talking and um, observing how, you know, people interacted with my son, um, how they interacted with me and, uh, so, so that was a kind of forced shift towards conviviality in, induced by my changed circumstances as a field worker. And um, that means that I spend a lot more time that was, you know, if you want to write a grammar, you know, is perhaps an initial hurdle, you know, because it slows you down. Um, but that is really precious if you want to understand all kinds of things that happen locally more. And uh, so that led, then led to several uh, team-based projects. So more conviviality, you know, um, because also it turned out that the setting where I worked was densely multilingual and I would not have been able to make sense of it by myself. And, but the, the teamwork also, um, was very different to what I had done during my PhD research where I had employed people on a very casual basis. So I paid them for elicitation sessions. And, you know, when I wasn't there, they weren't paid. They had no guarantee, you know, of a fixed kind of employment status. And uh, when I started doing field work in Senegal, um, I was determined in my funding to, to change this and uh, to give people a more secure, um, payment. Um, so we, we started in a Dobis project that I led and then in the Crossroads project to uh, employ people throughout the entire duration of the project on a fixed term uh, basis. And that in fact then uh, laid the foundations for something that is happening now. And I'll also briefly talk about um, that is also related to, to a, a based on <laughs> conviviality overall, if you uh, want to frame it that way. And, and that is a multilingual uh, COVID information campaign that is based on a literacy, on a multilingual repertoire-based literacy program that uh, we have been creating together with local researchers and um, community members since 2017. Um, and that 
has resulted in the uh, in funding an NGO uh, that is based in Casamance and that leads this work. So, so that was a brief introduction on all these aspects of conviviality um, that I feel um, are more and more important um, when I look at my research. But why should we care about this from a linguistic point of view? Um, well, I know um, this always <laughs> uh, seems like a provocative um, statement, but um, I believe that all African settings, or actually all communicative settings, are shaped by conviviality in and with difference, and hence all settings are heteroglossic or multilingual, or both. Multilingualism is, of course, an artifact, right? It's a, you know, it's perspectival, whether something is construed as happening within one language or between languages. An understanding how this diversity works grounds description and documentation socially and thus increases its explanatory power, like, you know, how did language evolve, how did it change, um, what is the role of variation of social networks, etc. And structural and social aspects can thus coexist convivially in language documentation and description. Um, and that's something that has been demanded for some time now that we should have a more so social linguistically integrated uh, approach to uh, language documentation. And this is because performative and structural aspects, as you know, all of you uh, here in this audience, of course, now are uh, intimately connected, so we lose a lot if we don't take them into account. And also linguists and research participants have much to gain from a more convivial research practice. Um, so something that takes our life circumstances into account, and I mean both researchers and research participants. Um, and this is really, there's also a strong impetus at the moment, of course, um, to turn our research into a more uh, equitable and shared practice to need to, to break with uh, extractivist paradigms that have dominated in the past, where we really go in and extract data for the benefit of research that happens in the West, and of which little or only token tokens arrive uh, with our research participants. And so I think uh, it is clear now that research conducted in Africa needs to have linguistic benefits for Africans and also include them. And uh, all of these are really tall orders, which adds, you know, really to the need to be more convivial and work more together. Because uh, one single person, you know, uh, cannot do all these things. So let's move to um, the first part, um, you know, why conviviality? Because settings are diverse. So we have convivial settings with multilingual speakers and very often the puzzles, um, the linguistic puzzles uh, can actually be uh, resolved or at least partly answered by looking at actual multilingualism. So for instance, in the area where I work, um, there is this big uh, question, how do linguistic features spread in piecemeal fashion? Um, so, um, because my work is in what uh, Tom Goodman would call the uh, macro Sudan belt here, um, one of the uh, macro areas um, of Africa where uh, many linguistic features are already spread, but really in a hodgepodge scattered fashion. And um, of course, uh, so Tom used a mix of syntactic and phonological um, criteria. And uh, Annie Riano and Nick Clements uh, arrive at a very similar uh, kind of uh, map of convergence zones based on uh, phonological features. And here, you know, here you see the Sudanic belt. Here, here you have your Rift Valley. Um, and um, of course, you know, these new contact zones or areas or however you want to call them have been preceded by um, 
Dolby's uh, sodonic fragmentation belt. And uh, of course, these um, contact zones are not arbitrary. They don't, couldn't exist anywhere, but there are actually interesting correlations with you know, climatic zones of Africa. And that is of course, because um, along latitudes, you find very similar uh, um, climatic and biological conditions. And hence it's much easier for people to spread and migrate uh, later laterally than uh, longitudinal. But if we look at the state of description and documentation um, in these areas that are areas of high linguistic diversity, as you can see here, you know, this is one of the areas in which we find the most number of named languages in Africa. Um, and we look at uh, case studies on multilingualism, we find there are very few. This is, uh, these are the uh, case studies on rural multilingualism in this area uh, and their location in Dolby's uh, sub-Saharan fragmentation belt that uh, overlaps largely with the newer fragmentation belts. And um, why is that so? Well, because, you know, uh, Africanists have very few resources, you know, small number, and it's very difficult uh, to conduct fieldwork in many areas. And also very difficult to have a sustained academic career in African linguistics. And so we have um, lexicological uh, coverage, but it's really not brilliant. So here Harald, um, you know, he has green dots for grammars and uh, dark green ones um, for long grammars and orange for, uh, you know, uh, specialized um, articles and orange for grammatical sketches. Do you see, we don't know much about most of these languages and we know even less actually about the social linguistic circumstances in which they are spoken and the linguistic environments. Um, but it is a fair guess if we have this really high density of languages that most of these places are and have been for a long time multilingual. Yet there is a paradox and that is multilingual places are very often associated um, with only one language and not just by uh, linguists, um, but also by, by speakers and outsiders. And how does that happen? Um, so you have convivial places, you know, here, so, you know, these are speakers with different linguistic identities and repertoires, okay, so each color is a different uh, one, okay, and they intermingle. So how do these places become associated with one language? Um, well, they become associated with a language that is, um, sorry, um, it's a bit messed up. So, with, that is the language of the founders in, in, in many of the areas where I work. In areas where Pier Paolo, uh, Di Carlo and Jeff Good have worked in Northwestern Cameroon, um, this is the language uh, of the political unit. So this language comes to stand for the entire village, although it has been actually inhabited and settled, uh, not based on linguistic homogeneity or the premise of having a shared linguistic identity. On the contrary, uh, in these small scale uh, linguistic areas, in, of which we know uh, in, in Africa, but also worldwide, there is long-standing movement that creates heterogeneous places from the outset. And so what is that founders never migrate uh, by themselves, so these are small family-based groups, but that they try to attract and host many strangers, very often people with specialized professions, um, in order to create a viable community. Um, and because they're small in number, there's also a lot of marriage exchange, child fostering, ritual mobility, economic migration. So a constantly changing patchwork of movement within small local rural places, but of course also beyond at the larger scale. So these convivial, internally diverse contexts require a rethinking of, of language, both uh, in terms of what role a language plays 
uh, in in this place, but also what a lang what role or language plays in an individual's repertoire, and how speakers uh, use and categorize uh, languages. And here I move to, um, you know, the the two extremes uh, on my first slide. You know, people who take language as something that is a given, um, a primordial entity, um, and people who do not believe in languages. And there is um, a recent school of thinking and, and speaking about language that uses the term languaging. And um, very often um, this is meant as negating the notion of language as uh, something reified that you can put in a box. But I think that is actually not quite entailed in, in many of the um, accounts of languaging. So I went back to the beginnings of languaging. And this is actually, these were two natural um, scientists, uh, Latin American natural scientists, biologists, who um, talk about an analogy between, you know, biology, so species and uh, social entities and say, well, actually, um, you know, language is uh, not an object. It's an ongoing process that only exists as languaging, not as isolated item of behavior. Um, so when we observe it, we actually create it. We reify it discursively by talking about it. And that is, of course, you know, a radical move away from, um, for instance, Chomskyan paradigms. And this then uh, was picked up by the post-colonial philosopher Walter Mignolo, who also linked it to linguistic domination attempts um, through, you know, uh, standardization, missionary language descriptions, etc. And said, well, when you write grammars and vocabularies of a complex set of languaging processes among a given population, you convert the process into an object and you own, you possess that process that you call language. Language becomes then an object with a grammar and vocabulary that you have and regulate. Um, and uh, from there, languaging has become more and more widespread as in this, uh, obvious in this quote by the South African linguist Alekiti Makalele, to talk about what people do with language. So the process of using language to gain knowledge makes sense to articulate one's thought and to communicate about using language. So the focus here is on doing things through communication, not on language as a system. And then something happened um, in applied linguistics. Um, um, in um, Lee Ways and Ophelia Garcia's uh, book on translanguaging and education, translanguaging gained, you know, languaging gained a prefix and became translanguaging to um, refer explicitly to the language use of multilinguals. But so if there is no language, how can people be multilingual? You may ask, and indeed that's a very valid question. Um, so what uh, Li Wei um, wants us to see as translanguaging is that multilinguals do not think in one language, even when they are in a monolingual mode. So even when they intend to produce text that isn't only one named or nameable language. And human beings think beyond language and use a lot of modalities and semiotic resources. The problem, of course, with trans languaging is that it always uses languages as uh, labels to describe trans languaging. And that is an inherent contradiction in those approaches to trans languaging. Um, they want to do away with the notion of language. And it also um, makes uh, it a little bit difficult to actually 
um, describe translanguaging using language labels when you do not talk about how these language labels uh, were arrived at. But the motivation of translanguaging is exactly to overcome uh, the solitude of language that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, that goes back to Jim Cummins, um, also from an applied linguistic uh, context. And he talks about views of multilingualism that see um, multilingualism as a combination of several stacked on monolingualisms, where you have languages that ideally are separate and should not be mixed. And so his perspective comes from foreign language learning where this is often um, the language ideology governing the, the classroom. But this is of course also um, an attitude to language that we find in many monolingual nation states and you know that many people who are uh, socialized into language in these environments think about language that ideally, you know, you keep your languages separate. Um, so if we want to question this, and if we want to look at what people do with language and also look at processes um, where you know, these discrete languages are not upheld, does it mean that uh, language has become obsolete? Um, and radical translanguaging actually says, yes, it does. But as I said, without reified languages, there's no talking about translanguaging. Um, so um, hence my position is that naming a language is always a question of perspective, context, and pragmatic and political intent. Um, so even, even, you know, if you want to talk about what people do with language, you need to reify it. Um, because it's, it's just a cognitive process of reification so that it can be talked about. Um, but that makes it really interesting to actually look at how people arrive at naming a language. And uh, so for that, we need to, you know, have a holistic outlook and, and really um, try to understand what speakers do and listeners or receivers in particular settings and how um, different parameters uh, converge. Um, so here I um, borrow um, a classification made by two uh, psycholinguists, David Green and uh, Juba Abutalebi, who um, look at executive control, um, in multilinguals, and they postulate three different language contexts. One of is a single language context. So these are pragmatic contexts that have an influence on how people activate or deactivate part of their linguistic resources. And the single language context um, is one where participants share only one named code, or it could be a register or a voice or however you want to call it. Let's say they share so if they want to uh, communicate successfully, their intention is to only share, to only speak Gudjaha. If one participant speaks Gudjaha and another participant um, speaks Creolo, then I need to speak Gudjaha with A and Creolo with, with B in order to communicate successfully. So as a speaker, I need to keep parts of my uh, repertoire separate. And finally, there is something that they call flexible multilingual uh, context or unconstrained context, where wide parts of the repertoire are shared. And um, so if we look what happens linguistically, um, then we can say, okay, if people have the intention to stay in the context of a single language, then whatever happens, uh, you know, when they use an element that belongs to another language, that is really a code alternation. Uh, it's not their intention um, to use something uh, that is not Gudjaha. Um, 
in a dual or multiple language context, uh, you, we have switching on blocks. So there is a conscious switching between registers that people are very often aware of. In, in this context, which I've now renamed translanguaging context, where people share uh, the majority of their resources, um, we can say, okay, there is code mixing um, or a few slacked, but actually very often um, this is a language-based perspective. People there are much less conscious and um, of, of actually, you know, the, the code association of what they do. And it's really more about doing something in communication than about language. And now we find all these contexts in multilingual community, but we find them um, in very different domains of life. So for instance, in the context where I work, the single language context is extremely rare. Um, what we find much more often is this context, dual multiple language context, because people never share um, their entire repertoires, but they're very, very aware of each other's repertoires um, and can you know, activate and deactivate parts very successfully. And what we also find very often is that, you know, for instance, in one household, uh, resources are widely shared. And um, this, you know, from a language-based perspective, you, you would say, well, this is massive, massive code mixing. But it is only code mixing, of course, if we would take, you know, monolingual speech as the baseline, which doesn't really do justice to the lived reality of these multilingual speakers. Okay, um, now I have uh, glossed over one important problem um, by saying, you know, if, if um, you can identify something as a cold alternation, that is actually not very easy because um, multilingual speakers in non-regulated settings have very um, individual repertoires that are based on their trajectories and linguistic biographies and that change throughout their lifetime. And the languages are not standardized um, uh, in, in most cases. And that means that um, both the repertoires are very individual and unique, but also, um, you know, what people associate with one language um, and the variation in speech is big. So it is by no means trivial um, and unambiguous to state, you know, this uh, speech segment belongs to language A. Um, and there has been a lot uh, already written in the multilingualism literature and the code switching uh, literature. Um, so people have suggested that there are ambivalent forms and uh, that there are floating items that do not belong uh, to any given language. However, I believe that that is only part of the story and that we need conviviality of perspectives. So we need multiple perspectives in order to understand what's going on. And I'll start actually by having a little bit of interactivity in this talk. Um, so let's look at <laughs> this. Can somebody tell me which language this is? Says it's Portuguese. Any other opinions? Spanish. Mm -hmm. Okay, it could also be English, two words together. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So Nancy said it's English, two words together, bus and car. Um, and it could also be uh, Catalan, exactly as Jana just said. But of course, you know, what language this is for you depends on your perspective as the reader. Yeah, if you are a speaker of uh, Spanish, Portuguese and Catalan, then this might belong to all three languages. If you're a speaker of only Spanish, then, you know, you would categorize it as Spanish. And if you're a speaker of neither, then you say, oh, this is bus and car with a typo. You know, somebody omitted the space. Let's continue. What about this word? French, French, English, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because we know that English is basically, uh, you know, French lexicoid creole. Um, indeed. 
but you know in boutique of course you had a clue what about this actually aha now it is touch see so there's a lot of perspective um, that enables us to classify and categorize uh, linguistic items and a lot of work is already done for us in writing and in transcription so transcription is not neutral it already creates a perspective so you know just to make it complete <laughs> which language is this arabic with a exclamation and a question mark said by richard indeed it could be arabic or it could be you know uh, any any language uh, that has been in contact with arabic and has a similar word for shop and so and what is this language this is actually arabic and wolof um so i just um had this little excursion to show you how actually ah somebody asked whether this is urdu and then somebody actually found yes amani that this is arabic only by orthography well spotted so this was just to show you that there are many, many different cues that we use to categorize language, writing system, transcription, orthographic conventions. But of course, also this, you didn't have the place, for instance, uh, where something is said or written and many more. So categorization of speech forms is not objective, but depends on a variety of social and linguistic factors. Now, let's look how that pans out in a conversation and what that means actually for descriptive linguistics and why it might make sense to combine different perspectives. So this is from uh, Rachel Watson's work in the Crosswords project. She recorded a conversation that took place at a Catholic seminar in the town of Brun and Casamance. And it was the intention of the participants to speak Yola Casa. Um, one of the transcribers was present as a speech participant, and that's his perspective on the speech event. And he tagged the entire stretch as being in Yola Casa, which is in itself a kind of intermediate lect of the regional Yola variety. And that has internal uh, diversity, more local lects. So only some features in this text were identified as belonging to Yola Casa by the linguist, and they're here. But she also identified uh, some features, and I've only given you one example, but there are many more, uh, where in this text she finds uh, features that she does not identify as Casa, but belonging to a different, more local Yola variety that is spoken in Brun. Okay. So already you see, of course, the, the text is not monolithic, uh, it is heteroglossic, but the perspectives diverge. And perhaps the most interesting question is which code is the remaining text in? We always have this approach, uh, you know, to categorize an entire language, but in fact, what prompts transcribers and other observers to categorize a particular text as belonging to a particular variety um, is only a limited set of emblematic and distinctive features that set it apart uh, from other varieties. And in fact, that renders this view of varieties, you know, as things in boxes obsolete, as we all know from dialectology, for instance. But so, the different perspectives are really important, um, I would like to argue, um, because, you know, the features can be ambiguous or not, depending on the perspective of the particular observer or transcriber or analyst. And the contradictions are really interesting because if we take them together with what we know about, uh, for instance, the repertoires, of the linguists and the observers, they allow us really insight on linguistic categorization, um, but also on what speakers may control, for instance, when they try to adapt their speech to uh, particular interactions. And so, um, you know, if you want to look at this um, from a language based 
uh, perspective, then we can say, okay, speakers have themselves very variable language use, even when they want to stay within one named language. So you can kind of create, you know, uh, a van overlapping Venn diagrams that show you what is variable in a speech in a speaker's um, uh, repertoire, and you can find a more solid, you know, inner core. And then you can look at what several speakers do, and then you find a core that you can say, okay, this corresponds to what is the stable part of something that I can really call a language system that is really shared and stable by many speakers. And then you can look at overlaps between these different prototypes that you obtained through actually looking at various speakers. And um, then you can say, okay, you know, if you want to contrast language, so then actually only these not shared parts are the language, right? These are areas where code is kind of reified and develops indexical potential unless you have a political institution, you know, like the Académie Française or Institut de Deutsche Sprache, etc., who, who does it for you and say, this is language A, right? And every year we admit 20 new words into your language, but not more. Um, and so that means perspective and scale, you know, so how many languages I have knowledge of and how many languages I am include in this will determine which features I see as prototypical or non-prototypical and how I classify them. So what is shared by all of them has no emblematic potential. What is shared by two or only one of them, you know, has different scalar potentials to index social uh, identities. And another thing that is really important is um, and why convivial linguistics, I find, is much, much more important in an African context and in many contexts of the world where multilingualism has not become uh, regulated, is that identities um, are relational and not absolute. So that means, um, you know, this, this type of identity where I have one passport and this passport is also my linguistic identity and I cannot really claim another linguistic passport or, you know, even uh, another passport uh, without uh, big efforts, you know, that is really far removed from the lived um, experience of many people in West Africa who can actually be many, many different things, you know, at the same time or in different contexts. And there can be many different things that would be seen as contradictory um, from this categorical identity uh, perspective. So there can be a Muslim and a Christian, or there can be a Bainuk and a Diola. Um, and they can tone these identity concepts up and down. And this is why we need, um, I believe, you know, this conviviality, we need multiple viewpoints of multiple speakers. We need to work with multiple speakers, but also have insights from multiple speakers and uh, multiple, you know, observers and, and make their perspectives visible. So it is not one right uh, categorization, but every different perspective adds some knowledge. Um, and this holds also for researchers, of course. And of course, uh, another thing um, is that we need to allow for multiple cues and, you know, not overestimate the importance of linguistic cues. Um, I think we as linguists give precedence to uh, language, you know, as very, very important for identity. Uh, but that, of course, is a Eurocentric view where, you know, linguistic identity and this, this language idea um, has become so overpowering um, that we really believe it is super important. But for many, many um, multilingual West Africans, actually, many other uh, features are important for their identity. And so that means they do not pack also all their identity into language. 
um, but many other um, cues are important for them, for instance, when they categorize so what for us is a linguistic categorization, but for them may actually be based on, uh, you know, a tie or a sectorial style or age or other social features that they know. Okay, now I um, promise I'm almost done. Um, the last topic was conviviality for social impact. And uh, so th that is something um, that I feel in African linguistics at the moment is a big, big issue because I feel as a whole, the, the discipline is under attack, I think. Uh, in a way we're seeing as not relevant, uh, you know, uh, social sciences um, have a much uh, theme, you know, or claim to have a much bigger social impact. And um, within African linguistics, I, I feel that there is need to en engage with social impact and also to, to claim it and um, together with social scientists actually to kind of inject new life into our discipline but also remind social scientists how important language is you know for instance for civic participation for access to information etc and Again, I found in what I was doing before in my own personal work, I found that impossible to, to reach. So I told you, you know, I showed you my failed primer, you know, that maybe had important symbolic function because it showed people, oh yes, our language is a proper language because it can be written in the Latin script, you know, so it is like French a little bit, but it had no practical use. Um, so if we want to have social impact, then in, in these thickly multilingual contexts, then I think um, it is only possible if we have convivial research practices. And nothing showed this as much as uh, 2020 with the COVID pandemic also putting a stop to fieldwork for many of us. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's really trivial to say that a crisis is always an opportunity, you know, to a catalyst for change that is long overdue. But I feel that overall in the field there has been this uh, reaction to COVID to think about ways in which we can collaborate more. Because now we also need to collaborate more because we cannot go to the field. So for once, we are as immobile as most Africans, which I, I, I you know, think is actually not uh, necessarily a really bad thing because uh, you know, we, we use a privilege that was really, really, really one-sided. So um, I told you that um, we started um, creating this multilingual literacy program that comes out of the Crosswest project and comes out of transcribers' experiences who said, well, I wasn't able to write any um, non-European non language of Senegal and now I can write all of them because we used a, a transcription system, which is of course language independent, but uh, using the official alphabet of Senegal so that it's compatible with all already existing standard-based literacies which are not used in practice. And because transcribers found this empowering and we wanted to create lasting um, opportunities for them that also made their expertise really uh, relevant in a local context, um, we together uh, thought that we could use this transcription to create a repertoire-based uh, literacy program that uses these transcription uh, conventions. And so we started with, you know, the former Crossroads team and uh, developed this method over three years. And now last year we uh, founded an association. So this is our president. And then you see the core team who were uh, present from the outset. And um, some of them uh, are teachers and teacher trainers in Senegal. 
And then we also have uh, new teachers and trainees. So, uh, and this is where we have been uh, active. And these are the languages that we have used in our materials so far. Um, and of course, you know, no linguist and not even all the linguists on the Crossroads project combined would have been able to have that coverage in terms of languages that we use in our multilingual materials. Um, you can find more about the courses here, but let me show you briefly what we mean by a language independent or multilingual, so really convivial, if you want to, um, education program. So our worksheets um, introduce sound grapheme associations. So which sounds can be expressed in which letters in the standard alphabet of Senegal using examples from the languages that we have in the repertoires of our team. Okay, so the, the material is multilingual, but of course there's a limit, that's our repertoires. But we encourage participants in the worksheets to use the entire repertoire, which they can write once they know the uh, sound letter associations. And uh, so here is some example from worksheet, uh, a worksheet for level two. Um, and you see that there are not everything is language independent, so people can actually select the language mode that they want to use. Um, they can write a text in one language, they can write multilingual text messages, um, you know, everything is possible. Um, and learners are encouraged to write their entire repertoires. And when the pandemic struck, um, we were in the middle of teaching classes, which we had to stop. And all of us together thought, oh my God, what can we do? There was a great feeling that we want to do something. And so together, uh, we devised a COVID-19 information campaign that we ran in all the villages in, uh, in which we have run classes since 2017, so where we knew that there was a critical mass of people literate able to read our message. And our motivation was um, that the official information is only available in French, which many people do not read. So we wanted to uh, present information in languages that are accessible to people. And we used print media and to a limited extent social media. Um, because um, radio broadcasts are very volatile and other social media like YouTube, et cetera, are not uh, within the reach of many people because they don't have access to the internet or they don't have enough money to buy credit. So here you see um, one of our posters. So the posters are tailored to different multilingual ecologies. So um, they all have different language mixes per location um, so that we ideally include all languages. Um, of which we know that they are spoken. So here you see um, one example. And uh, what was really interesting also in terms of conviviality again, uh, was that the, the whole, you know, the process of um, translating the message and shaping it was collaborative. So we had to find pictograms that worked. We had to really work on the message uh, from, you know, social, uh, perspectives, what can we say, how can we say it in the most uh, efficient way, but also from a linguistic point of view. So for instance, hand and arm are collexified uh, in most Atlantic languages. So if you say, you know, uh, don't cuff <laughs> into your hand arm, you know, well, <laughs> people can just keep doing this. Okay, so we had to take care of, you know, uh, always saying in the text in different languages, well, cough and sneeze into your elbow or into a tissue as a separate lexeme for elbow. And uh, we did a quantitative evaluation of the campaign of which I'll not talk about uh, in detail now, but just some highlights. What was really interesting, and this again brings me to conviviality. So monolingual campaigns would have been possible from a you know, communication point of view. So we could have run a monolingual campaign in Wolof, for instance, but that would have been culturally so wrong and offensive to people who already feel dominated you know, by a Northern Wolof speaking elite. Um, and the fact that we included 
uh, languages that are spoken only in one village and, and locally validated um, our message and also made it more trustworthy because people said, oh yeah, these, these, c'est nos parents, these are our relatives, we trust them, we trust what they say. But what people actually did, most people read um, the information campaign in, in more than one language, um, which is typical for multilinguals, you know, to uh, combine different resources in reading. I do that as well uh, when, when I read multilingual information. Um, so it was really important to be as inclusive as possible, to be multilingual, and because we included larger languages, we also could include smaller languages. Okay, I arrived <laughs> at my at the end of my talk. And um, so what I was trying um, to do today was convince you that the description of linguistic ecologies and insights in linguistic ecologies holds great promise for advances in basic and applied linguistic description and also in documentation, and that it's impossible without a turn towards conviviality um, and conviviality in terms of, of taking researchers and research participants' social lives into account. Um, but also, of course, inviting people into this research. It's not possible otherwise. And that if we you know, also look at um, how Africans and multilinguals in general you know, use language convivially, we can also create research that is socially relevant to Africans. So we don't do the primer that gathers dust on a shelf or the health center that is perhaps valid, uh, but not related to our research but we can actually bring something from our research that is directly relevant and can be usable uh, for social scientists in, in various domains. And I want to give the last word to people from the Casamos and their view of conviviality. So here you have um, from Chelsea Kratzik's uh, dissertation, um, um, some uh, research um, participant from Brun um, who conducted a social linguistic interview with her. So he asked her, okay, so you're from the US, so tell me, you know, how, how does multilingualism work in the US? And she said, well, you know, I come from a very boring suburban place in Pennsylvania where most people are white and speak only English and are very proud of speaking only English. He said, what? They speak only English? Why would they do that? That's, what do they do when they migrate or when, you know, when they have visitors? And she said, no, you know, they just expect everybody to speak English. And he said, ça c'est nul ça, which she translated as, oh, that's such a boring way to live one's life. You know, when you can be so convivial and creative, why would you not want to do it? And um, another from uh, my field site in Anyak, um, where somebody, you know, when I asked him, so, you know, how come, you know, that there are so many different people living here? And he said, well, why would people stay by themselves when they can mingle with others and when attracting newcomers makes them so much stronger? And that was my last word. Thank you very much, Felica, for your very interesting presentation. It's given me at least a lot to think about. Uh, with that, we can start our question and answer section. Um, so as always, it's going to be open to both voice questions and written questions. So if you want to ask a voice question, just uh, raise your hand using the participant panel. Um, and I will send you a request to unmute. Uh, if you want to uh, send a written question, just put it in the chat module and I will read it out. I do remember everyone that uh, these sessions are being recorded so if you're choosing to uh, ask a voice question or if you have your video on this will be part of the recording so this will be released on the YouTube channel. With that I'm gonna go to the first raised hand I see which was by Bonnie Sands. What a great talk thanks so much Frederica. <laughs> I love this and uh, there's so many things I could say but I'm gonna 
for well, say two things. One, I think language is like dance, and we need to bring that idea back in. And yes, there are different styles of dance, and you will step on those when you don't have the same rhythm, but they're the same movements. And we and yeah, yeah, as a phonetician, I do think of how language is embodied. But you know, even in the monolingual perspective, this is really helpful when you think about how speakers accommodate to one another in their speech, mm -hmm. and that there's so much more to identity than these. Uh, larger things. But my second point is this idea of conviviality, it's really taking on academia as a whole and where it comes out of the monastic tradition. I googled what is the antonym of convivial, of convivial. We get words like serious. <laughs> you know? And yet serious is what all of our research is supposed to be. Things like withdrawn, gloomy, sad. <laughs> now we, so it's when we expect our work to be serious yeah we need to be bring the joy back into our work that's what, why we all got into this i would hope none i don't think anyone got into this for money <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you for saying that and and i couldn't agree more and um you know i think this also this separation between our serious work and what we do in the field and what we do as individuals you know is, is, is really unhealthy and um, and that has become really really uh, strong uh, you know in the last year when I talked to many colleagues who had problems before you know combining the demands of academia with leading a normal life actually you know but now have to reconsider much more radically actually what field work is and I've always found it so strange and contradictory, you know, that I work in a region of the world, you know, where conviviality and sociability is so important, yet my research practice is all about, you know, <laughs> keeping that at arm's length. And, and so, yes, I couldn't agree more And the dance metaphor is really beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I heard there was another, oh, okay. Um, I see a long response by Andrew Harvey. I think I shall read it out uh, and then yeah, you can respond to it if you want. Yeah. Um, so he says, uh, first of all, uh, he really appreciates invoking conviviality in this talk. The Rift Valley Network has been a wonderful space, I think, uh, characterized by conviviality and concerned with the goal of breaking down some of the professional and methodological solitudes, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. His question is the following. I've had a great luck to spend some time in a small community in the Yeda Valley of Tanzania um, called Domanga. In Domanga, the place where he set up his tent and where he ate is a place where he hears and sometimes poorly used hatsa. Further down the road, many of the households use a variety of datoga. Visitors speaking Iraqo and Ihanzu pass by daily. And on top of this, everyone is switching back and forth between Swahili. Um, if he wants to study this situation, what are some ways in which he could approach this? So what are the common first steps within a multilingual approach? Okay, well, um, first of all, thanks for um, actually your conviviality also uh, by inviting me in, into this. And I think these new forms of conviviality, you know, um, are also really precious, um, cannot replace face-to-face -face interaction, but definitely have overcome hurdles um, you know, so I now collaborate much, much more every day uh, with uh, fellow researchers in West Africa and also with research community uh, participants in, in Senegal. Um, but um, your, your very serious question about um, what to do. Well, first of all, I think a multilingual approach needs to be multilingual. So there is not one approach. Secondly, I think you cannot do it all. Um, so um, by yourself, you know, um, that is clear. But I think what would be uh, really probably very useful uh, would be to involve speakers in in, for instance, um, you know, um, giving you insights in their metalinguistic 
awareness of situations or of categorizations of speech forms. Um, but of course, all depends on your um, research question. So the question could be, okay, so, you know, what language or languages is this place associated with or um, how do people construe identity through language? And depending on that, you would, of course, collect very different types of data. Um, but, but one thing um, perhaps that is valid in all these situations, I think, is um, that um, you as a researcher and your identity as a researcher will, of course, influence a lot how people interact with you. So in the Crossroads team, for instance, we had worked in a language-based outlook before, language-based documentation. So we all were a uh, language head. So I was, you know, Bainu Kudjaha, Alex Kobina was Bainu Kubaha, Rachel was Yola Kudjira, right, et cetera. And then when we wanted to work on multilingualism, people had already related to us depending on our previous intentions. And it was not really possible to undo that. So it, it goes beyond observers paradox. Um, people construe their relationships with us as the researcher. We are part of this multilingual ecology and we need to take that into account. Um, that probably doesn't answer your question at all, but <laughs> I think we should, we can talk more. Uh, with that, I think it ties in quite a bit. So uh, there's another question. There's a question by Amani Lucicello in the chat, which is, let me scroll up. In writing a grammar book of language A, which is spoken in a multilingual setting with language B and C, um, do I have to use multilingual speakers from all languages in order to obtain input in this line of thinking? So you're, you're writing a, a grammar of one language that is spoken in a multilingual setting where other languages are also present. No, I don't. Um, and I, I mean, you have multilingual speakers. So I guess these speakers would have different repertoires. So I think it would be good for you um, to be aware of the speakers repertoires. And, and really take time uh, to collect uh, linguistic biographies and try to find out what, uh, what speech forms people associate with particular language labels. Because then when you write your grammar of, of language A, you, you can understand better what language A is for different multilingual speakers. Um, but of course, you know, you, you cannot uh, probably you can never have a complete perspective, but it is important to understand which speakers you include and what their perspective is and what motivates it. And then Martin says, yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Martin says, no, if your language, if your grammar is of language A, you're going to make an abstraction of that, exactly. You're writing a grammar of language A. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that is completely valid as an endeavor. Um, but I also believe that it's important if you have multilingual speakers, you know, to uh, know what impact that has on their view of language A and the other way around. Um, regarding, uh, then he goes on and says, this is also very interesting. Um, you can take into account how your various speakers learn language A. Yes, I profited a lot from a second language speaker of Alagua and its insights, but of course he was not my only speaker. Okay, now this is also very important. Um, and in, in the setting where I work, it would be impossible um, to classify speakers in terms of first language speakers, second language speakers. There are other distinctions one can make about speakers, but that's not a good one. Also because, you know, language use is very variable, um, goes up and down all the time, adapts to great mobility and trajectories. Um, so, of course, if I want to write a grammar A, I want to find out what is the most stable common core among speakers of language A. If all speakers are multilingual, um, then you know there will be a lot of overlap 
with the other languages they speak and there will be also a lot of ambiguity and classification etc and there will be a lot of really really mixed language use so i i think in this case you cannot really decide who is a good speaker or who is a first language speaker but you can try to find a diverse cross-section of language users and try to find as much social linguistic information on them that allows you to understand how they use language and how they categorize language and how you then can interpret what they Thank you. I think with that, I'd like to go to Richard Griscom, who's had his hand up for a while now. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks to Frederica for this presentation. I uh, think you've highlighted a number of really interesting points. And uh, I have a question about your suggestion that research involve multiple speakers, observers, and researchers. Mm -hmm. So most training for linguists who are planning to conduct field work continues to be rooted in the lone wolf, single researcher, yeah. single speaker context. I'm thinking here especially of field methods courses. So I'm wondering what new or perhaps non-traditional skills should a collaboration-oriented linguist possess in order to successfully facilitate a team-based research project? And then what are the implications for the training that students of linguistics receive? Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I never had a field methods course, in, incidentally, uh, when I studied African linguistics. Um, I had to teach field methods. Um, and it's interesting, I would actually be interested in also what would other people who have taught and participated in field methods classes um, think. I always found the field, a field methods classes very artificial. Um, we try to emulate a field methods class in a way in this lone wolf paradigm where we sit a uh, speaker at a desk and have a very um, planned interaction uh, with him that we determine. But most of uh, ling you know, linguistic field work is actually the opposite, right? It's the lone linguist and then many, many, many people around us. So I, I always found that field method classes are not really a good preparation for the reality in the field. But what you have to do in order to actually get that speaker at your desk in front of your mic, you know, involves so much conviviality, creating networks, convincing people, um, um, you know, creating trust and relationships. And uh, I think in African linguistics, and that's also how it could actually become socially uh, more relevant. Um, you know, there are so many diaspora communities now, everywhere. We, we could have courses, uh, and in fact, I'm planning one uh, in Helsinki, uh, method courses where we um, work with linguistic communities. Well, we are, you know, in Leiden or in Helsinki or and, um, and that would mean that then, you know, of course that needs to be collaborative. One linguist cannot do it. Um, and you would have a group of students who would have to make connections, um, establish these relationships, go through all these frustrating phases that we all know, right? It doesn't always work. People are not interested in our research. They don't show up, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, we, we have time limits, we have academic requirements, we need to get a certain amount of data and to actually find how that works in real life. And also if we work with a community where the power balance is not so asymmetrical, you know, we actually have to make it useful for them. Otherwise they will not be interested in working with us, which is very different still from a situation that we find as European researchers in the African field where we can, you know, really um, because of our status and wealth, you know, have easy access, which is something that African researchers, for instance, if they conduct field work very often don't have. Um, so if you listen to African researchers, especially those who try to do field works in settings that are not their home settings, they have a really hard time because they don't have all that privilege. Thank you. I see a raised hand by Nancy Kura, who I asked to. 
Ah, fantastic. Okay, let me show my face. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Frederica. Thank you very much for a really, really great talk. I don't really uh, sort of have a question that's directed to the stuff that you're talking about, but I just really do want to say uh, this is really fantastic and it's really, it's really wonderful work and it's, it's great to see this. I just missed the point when you were talking about convergence and divergence, I think. The postman came, so it's very exciting to get the postman <laughs> to the door. And I just, <laughs> just missed the part when you were talking about convergence and divergence from a, from a, in a multilingual context because I was making, I was wondering whether there's a, there's a difference or do we expect to see differences with respect to the kind of convergence and divergence that we see across languages. So of course I'm talking with Bantu languages and of course, you know, slightly colonial, but we are very obsessed with looking at variation across Bantu languages and across those languages which are not necessarily adjacent to each other. So mm -hmm. changes that are taking place where things are converging and where they are looking a little bit different. And I just wondered whether would we, in terms of changes with respect to linguistics, would we be expecting similar kinds of things to be taking place in this multilingual context. So the core that we are seeing that would be across three languages that are spoken in the same domain and changes that we would see in a language change context, would these be similar kinds of things? I just, the terms just made me think of variation on a sort of from a broader perspective. Wow, that's, I need to pause and think about that for a minute. Um, I think, um, So, convergence and divergence are, for me, functions of language use in a speaker's social network. So, if you look at a setting that is synchronically multilingual, then you will see, you can see that change and, and that convergence, divergence in, in action. Um, and you can get dramatic differences, for instance, between households or, or quarters in a village. And then you can see if you follow one speaker, you know, how boom, this, you know, bump there, change, whatever, uh, you know, all of a sudden they start doing argument ellipses, etc. And they change agreement patterns in no time. Um, if you work in a Bantu setting, um, where you know that you know there has been past multilingualism, etc., but now you have a language chain. The languages are further removed, especially. That's your question, right? Yeah. So then, of course, um, you can only look at um, linguistic forums and try to extrapolate from divergences and convergences what may have happened in the past. Mm. But. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I, I think so. I work in a setting where we have um, no small scale uh, historical data. And, uh, you know, historical linguistics doesn't have much to help us with because of the, you know, complex morphophonology of Atlantic languages. So we have no reconstructions, or only very few, and great controversy. So in, in such a situation, what I find actually most promising is to look at actual multilingual speakers and look at what happens, what type of convergences and divergences happen in multilingual speech synchronically and under what social conditions. And then we can look at uh, language data where we feel that something has been going on. We know these people must have been in contact. And then we can look at the type of convergences, divergences that we see and have hypothesis based on what these things do synchronically. Yeah. So in a, in a multilingual uh, setting, is it, I'm not sure what you're finding. So are you finding that the interactions that speakers are having in a multilingual setting is more in the convergence zone mm. in terms yeah. of their own interactions? Um, of linguistic forms? No, both. No. So there's a push and a pull factor that's really interesting mm -hmm. because so the um, the pull factor is kind of of course when you talk a lot to people the general tendency is convergence right it's sheer ease of processing etc we have a lot of cognitive and, and psycholinguistic explanations for that 
but so in the area where I work, um, already the first Portuguese in the 15th century described the area as highly multilingual and diverse. And we know from the available historical sources where we have language labels and we know how these labels have changed. Um, so through the work of Paul Hare, for instance, we know that there has been a big overall stability with a lot of micro uh, migration and identity changes. So we also know there has been a uh, Portuguese-based Creole and Mandinka. So big languages have been in the area for a long time. So people could have shifted you know, to larger languages and converged to a reduced form of multilingualism. But they have not done that. They have upheld small-scale multilingualism with languages that are only spoken in one village mm. um, over this whole time. Why? That's the push factor. So that counteracts is these convergence pressures. And the only reason is social. People wanted to be united in difference. And um, I think uh, a lot of that is uh, related to size. So people were mainly settling in, in small settlements. So they wanted to have multiple alliances. And if you speak multiple languages, it's easier to have these alliances and also contextually change them. So you are my friend, you know, if I speak English to you, <laughs> but you know, tomorrow I speak French with that person and I don't even know you. And that has become exacerbated by the slave trade because people have been involved in, in the slave trade from the 16th century onwards. And that meant um, that in order to protect themselves, they also had to sell people into the slave trade. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, and th that means there are many, many social um, mechanisms of othering other people so that they were dehumanized and could be sold. So for instance, declaring them as witches or as possessed by a spirit, which is often related to speaking a different language. So. And then language difference could be seen as something, you know, as an othering strategy. But at the same time, multilingualism needed to be upheld uh, for these political alliances. So, and we need to understand these very complex social motivations um, that cause people to upheld, uphold languages as nominally distinct. And then we have to look at their language use and see how, how much do they actually manage to do so, right? And we find all these convergences, but we also find divergences in, in emblematic areas. For instance, greetings are hyper, hyper differentiated mm -hmm. because greetings are so very often, that's, it's like your business card, you know, that tells people, you know, which village or which area you come from. So they are much more differentiated than large parts of the lexicon or, or you know, of, of basic syntactic structures and morphology. Yeah. And then there are some things um, that serve as shibboleth. Um, so, um, you know, local variation that takes on social function. And that then is more stable, of course, it becomes unregistered. But without understanding the social uh, motivation, it's impossible to have any prediction. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is it's a really cool term, this convivial. You have to trademark it, it's really brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you are my witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I've looked at the participants. I don't see any raised hands nor anything new in the chats. So I think that means that these were all the questions and comments for today. Um, but then I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentation and the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and the entries for each presentation will be added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, 27th of February, uh, January, sorry, um, and will be presented by Martin Maus. And with that, I would like to thank Frederic again for a very interesting presentation. Of course, everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.